Welcome to Crash Course, a podcast about business, political, and social disruption, and what we can learn from it. I'm Tim O'Brien. Today's Crash Course, Israel versus Hamas. Gaza, a slender, 25-mile-long stretch of land bordered by the Mediterranean Sea to its west, Egypt to its south, and Israel to its north and east, is now a war zone. In the wake of Hamas's recent grisly attack, that left more than 1,400 Israelis dead and about another 200 taken hostage, Israel's military forces appear poised to occupy Gaza to try obliterating the Islamist terrorist group. Ancient religious and cultural animosities and contemporary geopolitical jockeying are the backdrop for this conflict. But this newest iteration appears to have been sparked by Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the U.S. seeking to normalize diplomatic relations. Hamas, apparently fearful of being isolated in the Middle East, may have opted for mass murder to derail those talks. Other factors are at play. Decades of simmering resentment about Israel's more aggressive regional stances and military incursions into Gaza and the West Bank, outrage about violence at Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque, and, perhaps most significantly, broader concerns about Israel's treatment of Palestinians and its most recent push to expand settlements in the West Bank. For its part, Hamas has routinely called for the destruction of the Israeli state. Iran, while pursuing nuclear weapons, has bankrolled Hamas and another militant group in the region, Hezbollah, making it a dangerous and divisive regional wildcard. With Israel warning Gaza's 2 million Palestinian residents to relocate as more intense warfare draws near, U.S. President Joe Biden has visited Israel to show support. A deadly blast near a Gaza hospital disrupted some of the plans around his visit, symbolizing, perhaps, how unpredictable and dangerous this conflict will continue to be. Joining me today to discuss all of this are Mark Champion and Andreas Kluth, two Bloomberg Opinion columnists with deep experience covering international affairs. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, Tim. Nice to be here. So, Mark, you arrived in Israel on Wednesday, October 18th, and we're recording on Thursday the 19th. Things are moving fast and could change, and I know you haven't had much time there yet, but what are your first impressions being on the ground there? Well, I think the first is what you always get in countries that are war zones or becoming war zones, which is that when you go to the place that isn't you know, directly in the line of fire, then things are completely normal and people... Yeah, you know, restaurants, cafes, their lives go on. They are disturbed and, you know, there is a sort of genuine unhappiness. You know, I'm, I'm going to do the awful thing and quote my taxi driver from this morning, but he has on his knuckles tattooed, you know, the name of his son, which translates as happiness. And then on the other side, you only live once. And he said, we always have these bad times. And so I keep it there just to remind myself and I never needed it more than now. And the general feeling is, with few exceptions, they don't really see a way out that ends happily, peacefully. So a lot of intrepidation, but, you know, in general, life goes on. And so how did we get here, Mark? How do we go from diplomatic baby steps meant to bring Saudi Arabia and Israel together to bloody, sprawling combat in the blink of an eye? That is a huge question and incredibly controversial. So I kind of stepped through the minefield, but essentially, you know, as I can best explain it, what has happened is the result of a series, you know, attempts that were made 15, 20 years ago to get somewhere towards a settlement never really worked. And increasingly since then, the attempt hasn't been made to make something work. So what Israel did was to disengage, move out of Gaza and, you know, pull their troops, their administration out. That was back in 2005. You then had elections. Hamas took charge. Hamas even then was committed to the destruction of the state of Israel. And this time later, you move to a period where Hamas has been preparing, has always said it was preparing for a major attack. At the same time, they were increasingly marginalized because of the, as you laid out, these diplomatic efforts. You already had the Abrams Accords where some of the Gulf states, Morocco, had, you know, normalized relations with Israel. Now you had the big one, Saudi Arabia, 
looking very close to doing so. And all of this was done without any consideration of the Palestinian settlement, which was kind of put on ice some time ago. And for Hamas, they felt, I think, that this was a kind of, you know, now or never moment. And they attacked, as far as, you know, one can gauge, with the intent to cause a major conflict, the wider, the better, as far as they're concerned. Israeli intelligence had no inkling this was coming. They looked very flat-footed, unaware the Israeli military got taken by surprise in a massive way, one of the most formidable military forces in the Middle East. How did that happen? Well, I mean, that's going to be the subject of a long investigation, you know, once things calm down. I think already we know it's probably wrong to say that there was no inkling and that there were indications and Israeli intelligence did have some indications. But the focus, the political focus, the security focus was elsewhere. It was in the West Bank because of years of fairly aggressive settlement policies, plus issues around Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. So you had the security forces diverted to protect settlements and so on. And also, you know, the intelligence services, their attention was diverted. They were worried about trouble in the West Bank. They thought that Hamas was happy enough in its running its enclave and that this kind of scale of event wasn't really likely. Andreas, let's talk a little bit more about Gaza's history, you know, the rise of Hamas and its relationship to the millions of Palestinians it claims to represent. How does Gaza view this? How does Gaza view the rise of Hamas? Well, I mean, Hamas is an interesting one because just before the attacks, or as Mark said, you know, things in the region seem to be going, a lot of us thought, in a better direction. And Hamas was not so much on our radar screens. They're a offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. So they're Sunni, not Shia, like Hezbollah and like the mullahs in Iran. And they have this kind of nihilist approach to the region, as Mark mentioned, is that they basically want to annihilate the state of Israel. And their domestic or their Palestinian rivals are running very badly in the West Bank. And they are at the same time deeply embedded with Gaza because some Palestinians in Gaza are intertwined with them, but mainly because they're using these men, women, children, babies as human shields, as everyone's been saying, intentionally in order to hit Hamas now, you'd have to also be prepared to hit these civilians, genuine civilians, every time as well. And in fact, as you know, the Israelis said to the Gaza and Palestinians, clear out, we're coming. And as they have been trying to clear out, it's in part Hamas that's blocking them because they, they want to maximize Palestinian casualties. And that's something very often overlooked now in all these, on the streets of Europe and the Middle East and around the world and on college campuses is that it's Hamas that wants to maximize Palestinian casualties and deaths and suffering in Gaza, not Israel. And so that's this bizarre, and frankly, like so many things, I think irrational, I don't understand rationally how, I mean, I would love local Palestinians in Gaza to now rise up against them. I would like there to be an effort to liberate themselves from Hamas. You know, this notion that the Palestinians in Gaza should clear out Andreas is something people can say in the military as they're about to consider occupying Gaza. But the reality is it's 2 million people with very few places to go. And they don't have, you know, there's not warm welcome for them awaiting in other countries in the region. So this, again, feels to me like one of these massive, massive issues here is 2 million people could instantly become refugees with nowhere to go, refugees within their own land. And that sort of sets the Palestinians apart from the millions of other refugees. I think the UN calculated there's more than 100 million now in the world. But, you know, the Syrians, and I covered other refugee crises, you know, in Europe, I'm sure Mark did as well. The Syrians went to Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, and then onwards to Europe. The Palestinians in Gaza, as you just said, have nowhere to go. And we should point fingers at Egypt as well, because it's not letting them in. Biden was there, and apparently there's some humanitarian aid trucks going into Gaza to bring stuff in. But so far, 
Egypt is not letting in these fellow Arabs either, and the Israelis can't let them in because they'd be letting in Hamas as well. So yeah, it's, that's part of the tragedy is that these two million are trapped there in, in the small strip of land with nowhere to go. And they can press their faces against barbed wire, but they have nowhere to go. And that's the tragedy of the situation. And it's not the Israelis that, that wanted it this way. Yeah, I think the cargo that Egypt's going to let through is 20 trucks or so. So that's also not a very massive concession. I can't imagine 20 trucks making a huge difference to 2 million people, but perhaps it's a start. Well, let's talk a little bit about Benjamin Netanyahu before we go to the break. He's had nine political lives in Israel. He was attempting to stack the local judiciary while mired in a corruption investigation before the war broke out. And he has spent years rattling... Israel's sabers at home. Mark, how do you think about him within this whole collision? Yeah, so I think there are a few things to pick apart there. You know, the first thing is that I think Netanyahu at this point is the political version of a dead man walking. So it's a question of time before he's gone because the anger at what is above all an extraordinary security failure will fall on him and correctly so. So, you know, that's one part of it. The other is, you know, how do you assign blame for something like this? Well, the first thing is, in a terrorist attack, you can only assign blame to the terrorist because, you know, the definition of a terrorist attack is that you are attacking civilians by choice. Nobody forces you to attack civilians. That is a choice. So he does not bear responsibility for that. But he bears responsibility for the policy failure that has led us here. And I think that is, I was speaking today with a former negotiator, you know, on the Israeli side with the Palestinians, and he dealt with Clinton and he dealt with some of the negotiations after. And what he was saying is that, you know, this is ultimately a policy failure of huge proportions. And it isn't just about security and these sort of things that happened just now that allowed this to happen. It is about the treatment of Gaza, which initially was a fairly well-intentioned project to disengage. It was kind of a recognition that if we aren't going to have a two-state solution anytime soon, we need to give some sort of autonomy, self-rule and so on. There's no future to occupying the territory. So it was relatively well-meant at the beginning. But increasingly, what happened essentially was that Netanyahu empowered Hamas. And he did so in order to weaken the Palestinian Authority because in the West Bank, what was happening was that his coalition partners, parties of the settlers of, you know, expansion, some call it annexation within the West Bank. So that what he wanted was not a negotiating partner for a two state solution in the Palestinian Authority or a strong authority. What he wanted was the ability to give his coalition partners what they wanted without too much interference. And he just parked Hamas to the side and essentially empowered them by weakening the Palestinian Authority. Because when you provide essentially no hope for a solution, where do people turn? He left them nowhere to turn that was non-violent. On that note, we're going to take a break, Mark, and we'll come right back and pick up our conversation. We're back with Mark Champion and Andreas Kluth, Bloomberg Opinion columnists, and we're talking about the already bloody and tragic Gaza conflict. Andreas, Joe Biden just traveled to Israel. Was that a good move or a rash move? I think it was a good move, and he did it very well. He's due to speak from the White House to the American audience tonight, but so far he's managed to hit the right notes, which is very difficult. Every time he's spoken out since the attacks, and again, he did so in Israel. I mean, so it almost went south on him. There were political risks and physical risks. The political risks included something like this horrendous shelling of the hospital in Gaza, which Israeli intelligence now think was a stray rocket from the Islamic Jihad. In other words, from, as Biden said, the other team, not the Israeli team. But because of that, half of his itinerary was in effect canceled because he was going to go to Israel 
and Jordan to meet with the Palestinians, Jordanians, and Egyptians there, which is sort of part of the iconography of the trip, the U.S. president coming in and talking to people on all sides. So half of that fell away, which made it harder, but I still think he found very good words in, again, as he had already not saying these sentences that you hear in talk shows like, yes, comma, but, you know, yes, we support Israel, but no, he was genuinely supporting them and calling this Hamas attack pure, unadulterated evil. And he showed genuine empathy and he reached into history and there were inklings of his own personal biography of loss that allowed him to empathize with the families of the victims he met. There were sort of echoes of the awareness of the Holocaust in the background. And that was genuine. So one audience, the Israelis, I think Mark may confirm this or not, but was genuinely reassured. At the same time, the Palestinians, Arabs, and all their friends also genuinely saw how concerned he is to protect them as much as possible. Specifically, Netanyahu sitting next to him as he was speaking, I, I liked one passage where Biden essentially said, you know, we Americans, after what we went through after 9-11, we understand the all-consuming rage that has now gripped you. Because we had that rage, but don't let that be your counselor, your guide. It leads to bad decisions. And he said, well, we are democracies and we're fighting terrorists and we're going to set an example by the way we fight. And I think these messages arrived, they were intended at Netanyahu and I think he intended them, but the rest of the world was paying attention too. His primary objective is, of course, to keep this war from widening. And so not just Hezbollah in Lebanon and Iran, but I think even the people Iran is supplying with weapons, which is Russia and even China and even possibly North Korea, he's assuming they're all listening. And he often repeats that phrase, don't, don't, don't. And he's got two aircraft carrier groups parked next to it off the Levant in the Eastern Mediterranean to make that clear. But he's saying, don't let anybody get ideas. Let the Israel Israelis do this properly and let us try to, to help the Palestinians as best we can. And I think that's such a task for subtlety. And he found the right tones and notes, even though half of the trip got canceled. So I would say he's been doing as well as one can possibly do whether the intended audiences are all listening i mean the people demonstrating on campuses and streets and the mullahs for instance i don't know so it's but enough in your mind the rich symbolism of him being there justifies the visit even if he's not bringing home any trophies or breakthroughs yes and to me it reminded there were other visits like that he was there for seven and a half hours i read as by pure coincidence seven and a half hours is how long john f kennedy was in Berlin in 1963. That was a big moment in the Cold War. Two years after the wall was put up, a lot of people were about to lose heart. He came, and after that, everyone found their heart, their lion's heart after that visit. But they and still so, had to wait, you know, nearly three decades for the wall to come down to. Well, actually, and in this case, I mean, when we get back to this conflict, this may be longer than three decades. Yeah. I mean, but although at the time, by the way, just before the wall opened in 1989, we thought that might be forever. We didn't think it would end in our lifetime. But that was a different kind of conflict. And I think this one is more intractable. While we're on the U.S., just one last piece on that, Andreas, which is that the U.S. is ramping up military hardware support for Israel as well. That has been curious to me simply because Israel has already been very well funded. It already has a robust military. There has been an argument out there that it actually didn't want outside funding or support because it wanted to show it could fight its own wars. And in a very short period of time now, we have the U.S. ramping up military aid to Israel. Explain that to me. I can't explain it very well. I mean, there's a practical consideration is that Iron Dome, this system, which we now see in these eerily haunting and beautiful images, right? When it's in action, shooting down rockets. But my understanding is that it's been in use so much that they need to replenish that ammo so America can help. Great. And of course, America should help if there's other ways to do it. I think there's a lot of symbolism with this. As you said, the Israelis are well off compared to the Ukrainians, for instance, had the money, have the ammo. I don't think 
it's going to come down to that. But I think there's just a domestic American political imperative on both sides to just show we're there with you and we support. And therefore, in every way, it possible. is now in every way possible. So it is not to me politically possible. I don't regard anyone, you know, that you see the pundits or the politicians. It is not possible now not to offer that because that's just a task. And the bizarre thing is that this comes at the very time as not half, but part of one of the two big parties wants to stop supporting Ukraine for different reasons, but exactly as strategically important for the United States to keep supporting Ukraine against Russia as to support Israel. And Ukraine does need the help more urgently, by which I mean, it stops getting it. And according to the Ukrainians, they might lose against Russia. Israel will could militarily win. It's not about that. It's how they wage the war. And as you know, they're now thinking of bundling the Ukraine issue with the Israeli issue, with the southern border, with Mexico issue, which is insane. And even with Taiwan, as if like every problem in the world into one package just to get it past the troglodytes in the House of Representatives on the Republican side, you know, just to get it through. The dysfunctional troglodytes. Mark, this could obviously all change in the few days between this interview and when this podcast goes live. But what is Israel weighing right now as we watch this unfold? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, so what clearly President Biden, German Chancellor Schultz, British Prime Minister Sunak, maybe Macron's coming too. What they all want Israel to be weighing is be very careful how you do this. Think about the day after, because what we know about these kinds of conflicts is that the more people you kill, the more that stirs resentment and creates a fertile recruitment ground for organizations like Hamas. And these organizations, you know, when you kill them off, they also metastasize. The U.S. was pretty successful in neutralizing al-Qaeda after 9-11 over a number of years. And then, you know, you go into Iraq, you kill a lot of people, and you have ISIS. Different organizations, same MO. And Afghanistan. And then you go occupy Afghanistan. So I think this is, you know, what President Biden was trying to get at when he was going back to 9-11. You know, we made mistakes. And clearly, he didn't want to say it, but going into Iraq was a mistake. And, you know, you have to think about the day after which is a great failure of the U.S. going into Iraq, not thinking about what will we do with this place when we effectively break it and own it. So the Israelis, you know, I think will be less naive than the Americans were, you know, in Iraq. They know all about Gaza. They've been there before. But I think one thing we don't know is how much they're thinking this particular issue through. Are they concerned simply with, we just need to go in and deal with Hamas. Everything else we'll deal with later. Or are they trying to think through what will happen the day after? How do we do this so that we don't end up with unintended consequences that actually make it all worse? And unfortunately, what we see doesn't suggest just from the comments that Israeli leaders have made and from physically what's going on with the intensity of the aerial bombing in a very small place. It doesn't lead us to think that it's a very reflective moment. It's really an operational one. We just have to get in there and deal with Hamas. And Mark, what about Egypt? What role does it have to play here? I, I think Egypt is just desperately trying to stay out of it. <laughs> they want, Egypt wants no role. I, they want no role <laughs> whatsoever. And to go back to the idea of, you know, Palestinians leaving, Gaza, we, we sort of have to remember that these are refugees, mostly. You know, so we're going back to the, you know, 1948 and the Nakba and so on. And, you know, these people who were displaced to where they are in some parts of the West Bank are refugee camps. They don't look like it anymore because they're 40 years old and they've kind of developed, but they are. And unfortunately, ethnic cleansing is a lot more common than we think. So, you know, what we just saw in Armenia, Azerbaijan, you know, end of 30 years of conflict, what happens? One side wins and the other side just leaves, the civilians leave. What do we see in Abkhazia, you know, a part of Georgia that the Russians now more or less control? In 1992, the small minority Abkhaz kicked out the Georgians' population, ethnic Georgian population, which made up half the population, and they kicked them out and they won't let them back in. Why? 
because demography is everything, you know. So if you are a minority, if Israelis are a minority within Israel that includes all the Palestinians, then you don't have, you can't have a democratic Jewish state. And this is at the heart of the whole conflict. So when Egypt says, don't leave, stay, stand your ground, what they're saying is that just being there is political. It is a political statement because this is, in the end, about demography and land. And this is why you ultimately, you know, most people who really think this stuff through, they'll say, I don't know how we get there, but we all know we have to have a two-state solution because there isn't another solution. You can't have a one-state solution because if you have a one-state solution, there can't be a Jewish democracy in Israel. And if you have a one-state solution, you know, it's either going to be that, you know, it's either going to be a Jewish dictatorship, which is no fun for the Palestinians, or it's not going to be a Jewish state and there's not enough trust there, understandably, for Jewish Israelis to say, okay, well, we'll go for that. We'll have an open election and take the risk that Hamas runs the place. So this is the great difficulty. You know, how do you get to a two-state solution? I think at this point, nobody has any ideas. And that's partly why that question about the next day is being pushed aside. Because, you know, how would you do it? Your one narrative about Gaza is to say that, look, we separated, we disengaged, we did a kind of test run for a two-state solution. You would say to the Palestinians, run yourselves, elect whoever you want. They elected Hamas. How do we have a two-state solution if Hamas is going to run it dedicated to the destruction of Israel and is a state with the right to arm itself and to buy tanks. How do we do that? Wow. Intractable problems. And then, of course, Andreas, there's Iran lurking and looming out there, aspiring to be a nuclear power, funding terrorism in the region, spending the last several months sort of, I don't know how to think about it, at least going through the kabuki of putting olive branches out on the global stage. But if it then turns out that they are more disruptive than they claim to be, that all becomes problematic. There's been, I think, some overly aggressive reporting suggesting they were more involved with planning the Hamas attack than they were. I think that that's been sort of roundly dispensed with, but I still think we have to find out more about Iran's intentions and actions nonetheless in the region. How does this all play out for Iran? Well, first, one thing I find encouraging just from social media is seeing that the way the Iranian mullahs are trying to play this great Satan, all of that, having everyone on this, is not the way the population is playing it, actually. So there's memes I've seen, I don't know how you know representative they are of Iranian, not mobs, but aggregations of people not chanting what they're being told to chant, because, you know, they've just been on the streets fighting for their own freedom for women to show their hair and the rest of it. And so the Iranian people, again, sort of like Hamas and the Palestinians and like the mullahs and the Iranians, the Iranian people shouldn't get drawn into this in any way. The Iranian mullahs, I think, as you just said, I also don't think it's plausible, although I have no idea that they were actually giving orders for Hamas to attack now, even though they've, of course, been sending money and weapons. But it didn't rhyme with everything else they were doing. As you said, they've been putting out olive branches. We just had a prisoner for dollar bank account on freezing swap. A exchange, a swap with the U.S. that we thought was going to lead further and maybe to talks to get them to stop moving closer to having nuclear weapons again. And of course, they were also, on the other hand, observing that Saudi Arabia and Israel and the United States were getting closer. And they were calculating. And I think for them, it's like, oh, now Hamas did this. What do we do? And they're expected to try to burn American flags, Israeli flags, all of that. It's all, almost like a reflex. Having said that, Iran is now the vector. It would be the vector for contagion if this local fire spreads into a global conflagration and inferno. Because of, if you remember back to George W. Bush and the axis of evil, Iran was part of that. Nowadays, I keep hearing the axis of resistance, and Iran is part of that again, where it's Russia, Iran, China, and China and Russia, they were just with many other countries in the global south also meeting. They want to have an axis of resistance against the U.S.-led West, of which Israel and Europe are part as well. And so if Iran via Hezbollah or something gets drawn in, 
then Russia and China and North Korea may get drawn in as well, if only because they will align against what they see as this Western rigged system and will, by aligning, may be tempted to kindle in their own regional conflicts from Taiwan to Ukraine or Moldova. And that's, I think, another subtext of Biden's don't, don't, don't. All right, we're going to take one more break, and then I'll come back to continue this very interesting conversation with both of you. We're back with Mark Champion and Andreas Kluth, and we're discussing the Gaza conflict. Mark, for Israel, is this a turning point or is it retrenchment? Yes. I mean, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Yeah. It is a watershed moment. Whatever policies were being followed before, it's clear that they collapsed. So Israel cannot just continue in the same way that it was with the same policies that it had. And the first instance of needing to change that and the recognition that they need to change that is precisely the decision, apparent decision, at least to prepare to go into Gaza and clear it out. There was this kind of slightly disturbing terminology that Israel had before for how to deal with Hamas, where they would go in every once in a while with a limited campaign, and they called it mowing the lawn, just trying to keep Hamas from growing into the kind of force that could do what it just did. Well, clearly that didn't work. So this is why there really isn't a debate here of any real significance about whether to go in. There's a very strong consensus across the parties. They brought another party from the opposition into a war cabinet. Benny Gantz, the representative, is, if anything, more rhetorically hawkish about this than Netanyahu. So the first instance of having to change the policy, that is going into Gaza, removing Hamas and making that change. The next will come with the reckoning for Netanyahu. And I hope a reassessment of this policy of weakening the Palestinian Authority. Israel does not want to reoccupy Gaza. It does not want to go back to that. That's just a recipe for a drip feed of coffins of soldiers coming back, of, you know, engagement and killing of Gaza civilians, which is, you know, there's no upside to it. So I don't think Israel has any intention of occupying. But they feel they need to go in, they need to change the game, they need to change regime, essentially, in Gaza. And when they do that, they have to replace it with something. You know, what's it going to be? How are they going to do it? They're going to need the engagement of countries like Saudi, Egypt, etc., in order to provide some sort of trustable support from the Palestinian side of this new regime that's going to come in. You know, it'll be very difficult for the Palestinian Authority because they'll be seen as in cahoots with Israel, but I think that's not worked out yet, but they're going to have to find a new regime of some sort. And they're going to have to think about, okay, so we need a partner. We're going to need a Palestinian partner that we can talk to that is not dedicated to the destruction of Israel. And we need to provide some kind of political path, some hope for the Palestinian side so that we don't descend into this again. That's what I hope happens. But to be frank, I don't know. I just don't think that the discourse is that far ahead. You still have a prime minister, Netanyahu, who, in order to have that policy, you would need him to go. Uh, Andreas, on, if we do come out of this, if we come out of this with a new role for the Palestinian Authority, is that a possibility or are we just likely to see years of prolonged chaos and conflict on the Palestinian side too? We know we touched on it earlier when we were talking about that Berlin Wall, but I feel this conflict is more intractable in a way than the Cold War was. And that's the sad thing is this eternal return to the not the better angels, but the worse angels of our nature, of their nature. But as Mark said, after this, whenever and however this ends, Israel must understand that it must help the Palestinians succeed in their statelet, in their proto-state. It must want them to succeed because the alternative is that they keep failing and then we revert to this. And then you have this. permanent conflict. And then you have permanent conflict. How do you make them succeed? That will require, in part, the next Israeli government to take on the Israeli 
far right and other settlers, and they must understand we must now make our former enemies succeed in order to turn them into future neighbors. And that is incredibly hard, and I'm not sure that that will happen ever or in our lifetime, but that is the only way out. A last question for each of you, for Mark first. What have you learned since the Gaza conflict began that you didn't know before? Hmm. I think I did not understand, like the Israelis, I think. I mean, I was familiar with Hamas, but I did not understand how carefully they had been preparing and how, frankly, efficiently they had been preparing for this. And they are a you know, more dangerous fighting force than I perhaps had expected. One of the things that really intrigues me about this is whether what went on in Ukraine would have been carefully watched by them, this sort of asymmetric warfare. What Hamas did is at a different level to what, you know, terrorists are always engaged in asymmetric warfare, but this was at a different level with you know, sort of combined force operations, you know, air, land and sea, drones, hang gliders, etc. And just the fact that, you know, a much smaller force in Ukraine was able to force back the second largest military in the world, who nobody, nobody thought that was possible. That's one of the questions in my mind as to whether, you know, we are in an era when there is an optimism for smaller forces that they can do this type of thing because they've seen the Ukrainians do it. And Andreas, same question for you. What have you learned since the Gaza conflict began that you didn't know before? I learned, or maybe I was just reminded of something that I'd been starting to deny, that it takes such hard, long, slow work to find the better, to move toward the better angels of our nature. And I think in the Middle East, not in Ukraine and other places, but they were doing it somehow. And then it is so easy and quick and abrupt to go all the way back. And there's always a new nadir, a new bottom in human nature below the brutality, the details of it were just more shocking than I thought we were capable of nowadays. And so it is a very dark and negative note to end on. But I just learned it's easier to go all the way down than to climb that little step up. And of course, it's disheartening because at some point, we'll have to take the first small step up again, knowing that we can all go all the way to the bottom any moment. We are out of time, Mark and Andreas. Thanks for joining us today, and stay safe in Israel, Mark. Thank you. Andreas and I will be watching from afar here in New York and Washington. Mark Champion can also be found on Twitter, at MarkChampion1. Andreas Kluth's handle is at Andreas Kluth. Their writing and their videos can be found on the Bloomberg Opinion website. Here at Crash Course, we believe that collisions can be messy, impressive, challenging, surprising, and always instructive. In today's Crash Course, I learned that Hamas is even more murderous and ruthless than anyone might have imagined in recent years. But I've also learned that it's important to separate Hamas from the Palestinian people. What did you learn? We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at the Bloomberg Opinion handle, at Opinion, or me, at Tim O'Brien, using the hashtag Bloomberg Crash Course. You can also subscribe to our show wherever you're listening right now, and please leave us a review. It helps more people find the show. This episode was produced by the indispensable Anna Mazarakis and me. Our supervising producer is Magnus Henriksen, and we had editing help from Sage Bauman, Jeff Krokot, Mike Nitza, and Christine vanden Blake Maples does our sound engineering, and our original theme song was composed by Luis Guerra. I'm Tim O'Brien. We'll be back next week with another Crash Course. <laughs>